Holy Spirit will guide you there. All right, here we are. We're moving through a little bit now. <clears throat> Looks like a few people fell off the boat. He's called us to that type of life. 
And I want you to ask yourself when you pray, think about how you've prayed over the last week, the last month, the last year. How many times did you tell God, whatever is going on in your mind and in your heart, like, let me be a part of it. Let me share with you. Let me be your vessel in this generation. I was talking to the fathers. That certain people have made themselves like, or they felt like a calling to be a certain like prophet of their generation. Certain people that said, you know what, I'm going to fight against impurity in America and writing books and making sure that, that, that this generation in America would understand what it means to be pure and what it means to have godly and holy, intimate relationships and what it means to be set apart. And these people commit to being different. That's who I want to be. I want to be God's vessel in this generation. Like I was saying yesterday, we have such a powerful potential as a Coptic church, and I believe in the end times, this is my own personal belief, in the end times, the Coptic church, it's not because we're Coptic and we're obsessed with ourselves, I believe significantly that the Coptic church is going to have an integral world, an integral role in bringing salvation to the world. I believe it. I believe it deeply in my heart. Because of what God has done through our church and in our church for all generations, even today, but the church has to rise to the occasion. The church has to rise. And when I look at in the crowd and I see all these people, I say, these are people that can do it. These are people that they just open up their hearts and their, their minds and their lives to God's interaction with them. Twelve sailor disciples turn the world upside down. The Bible describes it as men who turn the world upside down. Twelve men. No great education, no like deep, hardcore training, living with Jesus every day, living his life, sharing his life, made them something special. My goal here is not to just like rile you up and get you all excited to experience like the miracles of God and to watch like the magic shows of God. That's not the goal. And I think sometimes people get excited just to like, okay, I want to see that and I want to experience that. That's not the goal. The goal is that I'm committing myself to God's plan for the salvation of mankind. Like Moses in the Red Sea, when he parted the Red Sea. Was Moses out there to do a bunch of magic tricks? God said, Moses, I need you. Through the burning bush, I need you. You're going to be my vessel. You're going to go to Pharaoh. And you're going to do these miracles to change the heart of Pharaoh. And to free my people. And you're going to spend the next 40 years going through the wilderness with signs and wonders and being led by me, and you are going to be my guide. He didn't part the Red Sea just to show them, hey guys, look how cool our God is. The Red Sea had to be parted to fulfill the plan of God. And so the miracles and the magic show is going to happen because anybody that works for the divine is going to see that. But we, the goal is not to see the magic show. I don't want to call it a magic show. I'm saying a lot of people feel like God is going to put on a show for my life. That's not the goal. And so as we begin to test ourselves from within and to think about what my calling is, I don't want you to make it about you. I don't want you to make it about you. Imagine St. Paul when he was called. It says that God told Ananias, it says, you will tell him that he will preach the gospel to the Gentiles and he will suffer many things in my name. Like, hey, sign me up, right? He says, you're going to, to, to go through many sufferings for my name. Who says like, okay, I'd love to be a part of that. Sign me up, I want to be a part of that. But St. Paul, God knew the personality and the heart of St. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, that he just wants to honor God in whatever. Go and tell him how many things he will suffer for my name. God wants to make a connection between the physical world and the spiritual world through us. He wants to connect the, the, the heavenly world and the earthly world through his body. Through his body, the church. And I'll explain what that means in a couple verses. What do we do every time we enter into liturgy? You know why a dome, usually in, the, in an Orthodox church, you have a dome sitting on top of four corners. 
The dome symbolizes heaven. And the four corners symbolize the four corners of the earth. The Bible describes the four corners of the earth. And the church is where heaven and earth, what? Come together. That's what God wants of the church. That we would connect the earthly with the heavenly. And that's why you have a lot of, like you have a lot of Christians today that don't get that. And so they're not into the whole like saints thing and no. Or we're separating ourselves from the heaven and we're just living our own like little, you know, like a rat race here on earth. And that's not what the point is. God's desire is to link the heavenly and the earthly through you. And isn't that what Christ did in his incarnation? God took our human material flesh so that the human material flesh could become transcendent above that and become partakers of the divine nature. That the human flesh could become like God. How is that? That humans would become something above our fallen human nature. Isn't that why Christ came? Isn't that the purpose of the incarnation? God became man so that the Son of Man would become like the Son of God? Isn't that the goal? This is what we teach in our churches. This is what we teach in our theology. This is what the fathers of the church teach and the Bible teaches. But maybe I'm completely disconnected from the heavenly realm because I don't care. I'm living my own life and I'm doing my own thing and that doesn't, that's not what God wants. Ezekiel 22, 30 says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it but I found none. Found no one. Imagine God is seeking a man to stand in the gap. He found no one. Verse 31, the first word is therefore. I want you, I'm going to tell you what the verse is. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. That I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore. Therefore means God had to respond. And there was, people were destroyed and people were, were stuck in their wickedness and their ways of, 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 of living. Anytime you read the Bible, I always, I always teach this to, to people in our church. Whenever you read the Bible, you see the word therefore, ask yourself what's the, what's the therefore therefore? Like why is it there? And what is God trying to communicate to you? Okay, what's the therefore therefore? Ephesians 1, 9-10 Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him. God wants to gather the heavenly and the earthly together in him. But if everybody on the earth side of it is like not on God's radar, God's not in their radar, this is never going to happen. This is God's will. This is his desire that he might gather the heavenly with the earthly. This is what God desires, guys. The call is for everyone. Okay? The Great Commission says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. There's no footnote in the Bible that says, the following people are excluded from this assignment. <laughs> so when you're reading, you're like, man, good luck, Abuna. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> Sounds tough. Sounds tough. How are we interpreting the Bible on our own? We're, we're, we're adding our own footnotes. We're adding our own footnotes and saying, all right, God, good luck with that. Let me know how it goes. Be careful. We all have the same general call. Okay? There's a general call. But our specific roles within the assignment of building God's kingdom will be unique to us individually. Everybody is going to have a special role. In building a plane, you're building a huge plane. Can the guy that's building the landing gear say, I'm not like the engine or the first class seats, I'm not like the, the pilot's panel, so 
Forget the landing gear. You know, I don't know the recently, in the last like five years, there's been several planes flying in the air that all of a sudden they're trying to open the landing gear, it's not opening. Because somebody didn't do their part. Somebody wasn't doing what their individual call was to do. Like who cares about the landing gear, right? We have fancy seats in first class. You are an extremely important part and you have an extremely important role within God's kingdom. Now man the Syrian in 2 Kings chapter 5 <coughs> had leprosy, had a big position in the Syrian army, was big time, and he had a little servant Jewish girl living in his house serving him. And this girl comes to him and says, hey, I have a secret. Come and see the God of Israel. Come meet the prophet or the man of God, Elisha. This little servant Jewish girl who is probably 14 years old who doesn't know anything about anything other than cleaning tiles and bathrooms. She had her role within changing the life of Naaman in the Syria. Everybody has a role. We take into, God takes into account our gifts, talents that He's given us, our experiences, our physical locations, our connections. You might be in a certain location for a reason. Like, I'll be honest with you, in DC, we believe that we're in DC for a reason. Like, it's not just by chance that we're in DC. No. God has a mission for the Church of Washington, D.C. because we are in a physical location that is very influential, that is very, can impact the whole world. We can't just be like, I'm in the Why am I there? Even when you read the life of Esther, when you read the life of Esther, her uncle, he told her, you are there for this time. You are there in this place for this time because she was in the king's palace that was going to be the bride of the, of the king and convinced the king to save all the Jews because the Jews were up, going to end up being killed. And he says, if you don't do it, God will find redemption for his people outside, but you and your family will perish. If you don't take part, this is what God has put you here for. If you don't do it, God is going to do His will, but you, you're going to be outside the plan. Right in the plan. Don't make me First thing we need to do, like I, <coughs> I can't say that I'm like the expert on teaching people how to discern your call. Six steps or five steps of what I believe, six steps, of what I believe that you need to do. The first thing is we need to commit. We need to replace our agendas with God's agenda. Every time we pray to our Father, Thy will be done. Not, let thy will be my will. Change your will for my will. And let's be honest, that's what we pray. God, this is what I really want, so make it happen. I don't care what you want, God, just like, take care of us. Thy will be done. Replace our agendas with God's agenda. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You are not your own. You were purchased at a price, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When you wake up in the morning, you say, all right, God, it's all yours. Like, it's not mine. I'm not in charge. I was purchased at a price. And when you were chrismated, we talked about this yesterday, when you were chrismated and anointed with the Holy my room, you were sealed. You were made God's own. There's no like... Should I give my life to God or should I not? That, that's not the question. If you're, if you're, if you're chrismated, you're in. Or you can walk out and have nothing to do with God's kingdom. There's no like in the middle position. You are not your own. 
St. Paul said, I do not consider my life dear to myself. I don't consider my life, it's not about me. It's not about me. I'm purchased at a price. <coughs> Even St. John the Baptist, he said, for he must decrease and I must decrease. My agenda's got to go. My own plans, I, I believe, I firmly believe that God's plan is much better than anything I could dream if I would just submit and listen and commit. And what we're doing is we're saying that I'm surrendering to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And there are countless things that get in the way of fulfilling our call. We talked about some of these yesterday, money, comfort, relationships, security, pleasure, success. Are those things getting in the way of you committing to God? Be honest. Everybody has to be honest. It's a self-talk thing. Be honest. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. This is what is... I'm afraid to be not successful. I'm afraid that I'm going to be in an unsafe position. I'm, gonna, I'm afraid to not take control. Who says you have control? Can you guarantee that you're going to have a job tomorrow? Can you guarantee your health? Can you guarantee your own security? Then we're fooling ourselves. We're fooling ourselves thinking that I have everything in control. Who said? Tomorrow, everything can be taken away. Because it's not in your control. Be careful. It's easy to get pulled off course. And when you notice that those things, like I said, money, time, pleasure, relationships, are driving you, know that you're not within the call of God. If there are other things that are driving your life, you are not within the call of God. You're following your own purposes. If success is the ultimate thing that is going to drive every decision, you're not within the call of God. Does God want your success? Yes, God will prosper you. But that's not the goal. The goal is not the prosperity. The goal is God and following Him. Abraham, my favorite, God calls him He says, Get out of your country and away from your father's house and go to a land that I will show you. Where is it, Lord? I'm not going to tell you. Like I said, you're on a need to know basis. Just follow. Okay, he follows. He gets to a point, follows year after year. He's going, he's going, he's going. And you want to know what happens? Abraham gets to a place and God says, This is the land which you shall inherit for you and your children. And he looks around and he's like, there's a family here, God. Like there's, there's nothing here. And he couldn't imagine that God would lead him to a place of famine. And so the first thing he did, when he started to be aware of the desires of his heart, what did he do? The Bible, the next verse says he went down to Egypt. And he lied to Pharaoh about his wife, his gorgeous 75-year-old wife. <laughs> that the Pharaoh was going to take her away from him. And so he lies that she's my sister so nobody steals the knockout grandma. Like, <laughs> he made this plan. He goes down to Egypt. Do you know what, Egypt? Because Egypt, believe it or not, was the place of prosperity. Egypt represents the world. I know it's hard to believe. It was, though. It was. Trust me. Oh, my dunny. And Egypt, you see, Abraham had this craving that he didn't trust that God could satisfy. God brought him to a land and says, this is your land. He looks around and sees a famine. Uh, I think there's a mistake in the plans. There's a famine here. Hey, I've been following you all these years, and you're going to bring me to a land of famine? I'm going to Egypt. He goes through this whole ordeal, gets in trouble, wife is taken, God punishes Pharaoh, gives the wife back. And it says in the beginning of Genesis 13 that he went back to the land where he was called originally, the land of famine. And it says that he and Abraham was very rich. God didn't say there would be no famine. He said, I will bless you. Even if there's a famine, I'm going to bless you. But God, I'm going to bless you. Do you trust me or not? I'm going to bless you. Be honest. 
The cravings of your heart are leading you outside of God. Look, that's what the church fathers called passions. That whatever you don't allow God to satisfy within you, and you go outside of God to get it satisfied, those are passions. Those are the evil passions. What are the cravings of your heart? And how are you getting your passions, your desires satisfied? I'm in a land of famine, Lord. I need food. I need to feed my animals. I need to take care of my wife. You need to meet these needs. He shouldn't have went to Egypt. When Isaac's life came, chapter 26, Genesis 26, Isaac's life comes, and Isaac is kind of in the same position. There's a famine, and God says, do not go down to Egypt. Don't follow what Abraham did. He literally says, do not go down to Egypt. Don't run after the world to think that, okay, I'm going to follow God, but like, I'll go refill on Egypt and come back. You don't trust God. You don't trust God. You need to commit. How are you getting, you're getting your needs satisfied? <coughs> Believe me, once you decide you're willing to lose your life for Christ, the rest is easy. I promise you, the rest is easy. First thing you need to do is you need to deny yourself. Once you are willing to accept that I need to deny myself, I promise you, God is going to leave from there. You've accepted this. In your mind, khalas, no pushing back. Luke 9, 23 to 25 says, anyone who would come after me, he must deny himself. He must deny himself. Keyword, he must deny himself. And take up his cross daily and follow him. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my, for my sake will find it. Ask St. Peter. St. Peter, you left fishing. You left everything. Do you regret it? Regret it? Do you know that I raised a dead person with my prayers? Didn't I cast out demons with my prayers? Do you know that I saw Christ in all his glory and Mount Transfiguration? Do you know that one of my sermons changed 3,000 people in one day? Credit? You're going to tell me fishing? You're going to tell me the world? That's nonsense. Ask anybody. Ask St. Paul if you regret it. Would you have changed anything? Never. Never. He would never sell out all that he inherited in God for the stupid things of the world. No way. We have to understand that we need to deny ourselves. I know this is like a, it's a difficult passage and there's like a paradox in it. That you're going to find the fulfillment of your deepest desires and purpose only when you let go. I know you're, you're, you're struggling, you're trying to find, we're all struggling, I'm trying to find like the satisfaction. Until you let go, it will never happen. But I would and I tried, and this happened. It's never going to happen until you let go. You gotta commit to God's agenda. Committing ourselves to his agenda means living a life of worship. What is worship? In the liturgy, what do we do? Maybe we, not everybody understands this concept. In the liturgy, the liturgy is an exchange of life. I come and I lay my life down on the altar, and from the altar I take what? His life. In the Old Testament, what was worship? Sacrifice. Offering sacrifices. Worship wasn't singing a song, okay? Worship was coming and laying down my life as a sacrifice. And that's why St. Paul says, there, I beseech you therefore, brethren, offer your bodies as living sacrifice. And that's what we are doing in every liturgy. When you want to worship, if you really want to worship God, you come and you offer a sacrifice. Otherwise, I have like a news flash for you. If you've ever been to like a Catholic mass, they still have this tradition. Whenever they like come in, they bring in the host. There's, they bring in an offering. People are carrying bananas or whatever. Like in Africa, people bring like goats. And like, you find people come and bring an offering. I bring an offering, and then I'm going to eat of the offering on the altar for myself. I give him my life. He gives me what? His life. 
I'll give it to you. Just give me your life. Give me what you have and I promise you. You give me your life, I'll give you my life. We'll make a trade. Really? Really, God? That's worship. Ask yourself, do you have a life of worship? Ask yourself sincerely, not taking communion, not like, do I have a life? Do every day I come and I wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I offer myself on your altar. What are you going to do? Money? Does God need your money? Your hundred bucks? Like, come on. God needs your heart. Simon, give me your heart. Give it to me. And you will experience what eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Eye has not seen it. So if you're looking for something that your eyes have seen, it's too small, it's too shallow, it's stupid. You need to live a life of worship. How do we do that? The fathers of the church teach us, that's why in the Orthodox Church we have a discipline. We have an ascetic life. That's why we pray the canonical hours with the Ebbeyah. And that's why we have, because every hour I'm offering myself and I'm receiving Him. I'm offering myself and I'm receiving Him. I'm trading myself all day. Sometimes I take it back, the third hour I give it back. I struggle here, the sixth hour I'm giving it back. Ninth hour I'm giving it back. Because I do not want to hold my own life. I want Him to have my life. And I want to have His life. Because His life, and that's what being partakers of the divine nature means, is that we share in His life. The life that is in Jesus. And that's meant for each and every one of us. You know, Abraham, when he got to the land that God had showed him, you know what he did? First thing he did is he built an altar and he pitched a tent. He built an altar that was a permanent foundation. The altar was something that was going to be ongoing. And it was costly because it was permanent. And he pitched himself a tent. He pitched himself a tent. What does that mean? So I used to, we used to go, when I lived in LA, we used to go build houses in Mexico. And some of the people from my, my, my church in LA are here. And they've been with me on these trips where we go. And if you've ever went gone camping with Coptic people, you ever put up a tent with Coptic people? <laughs> <laughs> it's flimsy, it can go away. It can just fly away in a second. Abraham, he built himself an altar for God. That's permanent and it's costly. Himself as a tenant. Why? Because he's free in God's hands. Pick up the tent and move it somewhere else. No problem. Are you free in God's hands or have you built yourself a permanent foundation and God has the tent? And any wind that comes, and it goes. Whatever our Isaacs are. You see, Abraham's sacrifices were growing. First was leave the father's house, leave the land. He gets to a point where his shepherds were arguing with Lot's shepherds. They get in a big fight. Abraham says, look man, you go up, I'll go down, you go left, I'll go right. Take whatever you want, I don't care. Even though it's God's, Abraham's promise, he gives it to Lot. I don't care. <coughs> God asks him to circumcise. It's a big sacrifice, he does it. He does it when God has never fulfilled his promise yet. Never fulfilled his promise of giving him a son. Finally gives him a son. Says, all right, Abraham, take your son, your beloved son, whom you love, Isaac, and offer him as a sacrifice for you. Early in the morning, Abraham, who barely could leave his father's house and took Lot with him, even though he was supposed to leave all that, he even took his father with him, if you read in between the lines. He didn't leave his father. Later on the end of his life, sacrifice Isaac. That's it. I'm yours, Lord. And the sacrifices grow, but the love also grows. The love grows. There's this love relationship that is shared with God that like, you want Isaac, take Isaac. Because I know you, Lord. I know you love me, and I love you. You're going to raise him from the dead. And that's what the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11. Whatever our Isaac is, God is asking us to take it to the altar and sacrifice it to him. What's the most valuable thing that you possess that you're willing to offer to the Lord? What's the most valuable thing 
that you are willing to offer to the Lord. Maybe it's your time, your talents, your money, your relationships. You know the rich young man? He wanted to, but he just couldn't. He says, Lord, what do I need to do to be saved? Good teacher, what do I need to do to be saved? He says, go, sell your possessions to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. And he went away, sad. Anything else, Lord? Anything else? I promise you. Obey the commands, obey the commands. That's not what I want. I want what you love most. I want what you love most. And God, just like he did with Abraham, whether he wants to take it or not, that's up to God. He didn't take Isaac. He didn't take Isaac. God may not necessarily take your Isaac, but he wants the heart that is willing to offer and that is willing to let go. Next thing we need to do is pray. You're like, okay. What's so like revelation about that? Matthew 6, 6 says, But when you pray, go into your room, <coughs> excuse me, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. What does that mean? We need to lock out all the noise. How to shut the doors? Lock out all the noise and disturbances in our lives to discover the secret callings of God. You're not going to know the call of God. You've got too much junk going on. You're too connected. I know this is the day and age where everybody's connected to everything 24-7. 25-7. Be honest, when you wake up in the middle of the night, you've got to go to the bathroom. Before you go to your bed. Facebook. What's going on at 2 o'clock in the morning? That wasn't on at midnight when you checked the last time. Connected. I'm connected. I need to shut the door. I need to shut the door to the outside world. I need to detach every time we stand before God. You know what shut the door means? Crucify the world. Crucify the world in your life. When we stand before God, we say, Lord, I'm not bringing the world in with me. I'm shutting the door and I'm crucifying the world behind me. The world behind me stays. I don't want that. I'm entering because I want what you have. When you pray, do you crucify the Lord? Or do you kind of leave your foot in between the door? Leave it open just in case, like, things don't go wrong with God, I can bring in whatever I want from the outside. Shut the door means shut the door and lock it. So that God can share with you his secrets. God has secrets. When you look at the life of Abraham, chapter 18, right before God was about to just destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, you know what God said about Abraham? Shall I hide something from Abraham? Shall I hide what I'm about to do from Abraham? Really, God? Like, Abraham wakes up in the morning, and God says, all right, I'm going to report to Abraham what I'm going to do. All right, God, I'm waiting for the report this morning. Abraham, what does it take? That God says, I can't, like, hide anything from Abraham. What? Who's Abraham? The Bible says, for I have known him. Whenever the Bible talks about knowing Knowing someone, it's like the same way that Adam knew Eve. Like a marriage, an intimate sharing of a relationship. So when Abraham told, when God told Abraham, he says, shall I hide what I'm doing from Abraham? Could you imagine? You wake up in the morning, God says, I'm not going to hide what I'm doing from you. What? You're going to share your secrets with me? No, I'm going to share my secrets with the Abraham-like character. The person that Circumcise yourself, okay. Covenant, okay. Land, okay. Isaac, okay. Yes, Lord. Whatever you want, Lord. I would have been a hide from Abraham. You know what he says? I can't hide from Abraham. Because Abraham is part of the plan. Abraham, his children are going to fill the earth. Imagine if Abraham doesn't know the plan of God. He's going to mess everything up. He has to know. <laughs> As God's servant, I'll be honest with you. God invites me to go speak at a retreat. I say, God, that's your retreat, it's not mine. I'm your servant. If you don't bless me, you're going to mess up your own mission. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's up to you. Do whatever you want. I've made myself yours. 
If you're going to bless me, like, of course he's got to share what he wants to give with me. He has to. Because I'm doing his work, I'm his. If he doesn't share with me, who's he going to share it with? Believe me, God wants to give you something, but he wants to know you. Like he knew Abraham. Like Adam knew Eve in an intimate way. We have to shut the door. John the Baptist. You know John the Baptist was in the wilderness for 30 years? And he had six months of glory. 30 years shutting the door to the world, shining like a lamp. John chapter 5 says that John was a shining lamp. He was a shining lamp. What was he doing? He was in the wilderness worshiping. Filling, 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 filling. You want to know what, what John the Baptist did in six months? He changed all of Israel. It says all those from Judea and those from Jerusalem came to him confessing their sins and were baptized by him. These people hadn't had a prophet for 400 years. Imagine that all the, when the Bible says all the land of Judea, I mean all the land of Judea. It's like saying, okay, all the city of Orlando came out to a Buddha Paul to hear his talk. Why? Because it's a shining land. That's what John the Baptist was. 30 years waiting upon the Lord. And this is something that is so important for each and every one of us. You have to understand this part right now. In our culture, we don't know what waiting means. Like God, it's been four seconds since I prayed. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yes, yeah, Salam. Like, like, like you've done anything for me. Like sometimes I feel like God is saying like, Wait, good things come to those? Wait, wait. Because in that waiting period, God is doing an inner mystical work inside of us. And in six months, John the Baptist turned the world upside down. He prepared, he literally prepared the way of the Lord. Jesus came and was ready to go. 30 years in the wilderness. But those last six months, all glory. All glory. He had eight words. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He didn't have charismatic preaching and cool funny stories. He didn't have any of that stuff. Eight words. And the whole Judea and Jerusalem came confessing and baptized. Eight. Praying. Getting filled. Like, you want to be the hero today? Does it work like that, that way? I'm God's servant. When he's ready to use me, he'll use me. There's a waiting on the Lord element. Also, let God's spirit speak to your spirit. The decisions that you make, you want to make sure that they're not in the flesh. A lot of us know how to spiritualize like fleshly endeavors. <coughs> make sure that what you're doing, even if it's a spiritual thing, I could be sometimes invited to go and serve in a place. What's inside? Why am I going? What's inside of my heart that I'm doing this? John chapter 3 verse 8 says, The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. How do you know what are the things of the Spirit? Remember how yesterday I was talking about your spirit is like a small child, it's like a small seed that needs to grow? It's not an emotional experience. And I think sometimes, like a lot of people tell me, Abuna, I went to another church and it was just like this great feeling. And yeah, you know the emotions are tied to the flesh. Right now as I'm speaking, I can tell Maria starts strumming some music in the background. Everybody feels like they want to come give me a hug. <laughs> I'm playing with your emotions. I'm not getting to your heart. I'm not speaking to your spirit. The spirit speaks to the spirit. It's not, the spirit is not material, so it's not felt. When you go to a liturgy, you come out saying, all right, let's go. Let's go serve the world. You don't have that feeling. Because it's not an emotional experience. It's a mystical transformation. God is doing something I cannot see, I cannot feel, but it's there, it's real. His spirit speaks to my spirit. And that has to, yeah, I have to believe in that. That every time I stand, I say my prayers, I do the egbeya. Yeah, I don't feel anything. Something is happening to your spirit. 
That's the food of the Spirit. Matanias, food of the Spirit. Fasting, food of the Spirit. The liturgical prayers are food of the Spirit. All these things are feeding the Spirit that the Spirit begins to discern the things of God. It's not about the flesh. Not just because something sounds like a good idea that it's from God. There's a great uh, <coughs> missionary in the Great Depression of England. His name is George Mueller. He used to open up um, orphanages for street children. There was tens of thousands of children that were just living on the street as like homeless children. And he would open up orphanages. And before he would open up an orphanage, he would pray for days and say, Lord, if this intention in my heart is not from you, take it away. Who cares? It's an orphanage. Like, who cares if it's about you? Help me. Orphans. No. Nothing will be done according to the flesh. Because when it's in the spirit, one thing that he does is going to be blessed. Anything that he opens, anything that he does, anything that he says, anywhere he goes, it's the spirit. The spirit led him to do it, it's going to be blessed. <coughs> it has to. Not when things are done according to the flesh. So I have to feed <coughs> the spirit. Peter's desire was not to walk on water, but to be with Christ. He wanted to be with Christ. And that's what I mean by, by prayer. Prayer is that place that the Holy Spirit changes the cravings of my heart. That the Holy Spirit changes the cravings of my heart. Be honest, what are the cravings of your heart? What do you crave right now? Maybe it's not all that I'm talking about. It's okay. A committed life of worship and prayer and praying in the Spirit and to the Spirit will change. All of a sudden, my cravings will change. Do you wish your cravings would change? Like, Lord, I hate things that I desire. Leave that up to me. Let the Holy Spirit change the cravings of your heart. The next thing is we have to prepare. What do I mean by prepare? As we seek to discover God's plan for our life, we also have all of scriptures at our disposal. The word of God should direct your path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I need to be in the word of God. I'm not talking about reading the Bible. Nowadays, I don't know what your father at the convention tells you, maybe to like read. Read the Hadith paragraph. Read the paragraph. <laughs> be in the word. Eat the word of God. Eat the word of God. Like, come on. I'm going crazy. But like, sometimes I'm like, you're gonna, like, my old man is going to come out right here. <laughs> like, come on. Like, God gives us his word. A slap. <laughs> Read the word of God. Get into the word of God. It is life. My words, they are spirit and they are life. I know people that are, I've, I've read stories of terrorists that pick up the Bible to attack the Bible, break it up, show about how it's messed up. In just a few months of reading it, they get down on their knees and they say, Jesus Christ is Lord. But the people in the church, Pope Shiro used to always say when you go on visitation to the priests, don't bring a Bible. Why? So that you can ask for their Bible. And when you get their Bible, you do one of these, and you blow the dust in their face, you say, Bravo <laughs> Get in the Word, the Word of God. I don't need glimpses of the Word of God. When the full revelation of God is here in the Word of God, the Word of God is my answer. How do I know if it's God's will? Did you read the Word of God? You know, people always tell me, okay, Buddha, I need advice, but don't tell me to pray and read the Bible. I ain't got nothing else. <laughs> I can't make up a 2014 version of what you're supposed to do. Just read your Bible. Be in the Word. Eat the Word. There should be, your Bible should be falling apart after 30 years with tape and duct tape and all kinds of funny stuff because your Bible cannot handle your teeth marks. Because the Bible in you is alive. That when the Bible is burning in my heart, 
can change anyone. One word can change anyone. Prayerfully read his word to discern the intentions of your heart. The Bible says that the word of God is like a mirror. In the book of James it says the Bible is a mirror and it tells you what's on the inside. What are your intentions? Is this all about you? What are you, what are you wrestling for? What are you fighting for? Your Bible is telling you you're messed up. Fix it. Don't go outside with your hair kombucha. Like, <laughs> fix it. When you look in the mirror, your hair's messed up, let's go out. Look in the mirror, the mirror says, uh-uh. You go back into your room, you fix it, and then you go out. That's the word of God. That's the word of God. We need to be like all over the word of God. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the rule. Proverbs 16. If you think that you're going to be able to handle whatever's going to come your way in life without reading the Word of God, studying, meditating, you're, you're mistaken. Next thing is, is that God has given us the church. God has given us the church and He's given us spiritual elders and fathers within the church to also help you test the intentions. John Cassian on his book on the conferences is talking about the discourse with St. Moses the Strong. And St. Moses the Strong is talking about <clears throat> how Christ, when he spoke to St. Paul, like Christ appeared to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? How long will you kick against the goats? And then what happens? <laughs> Go to Ananias and he will tell you what to do. What do you know? No, it's not going to come from you. Go ask someone. So that you don't just get used to Everything is in my mind that I do it. No, go to Ananias. He'll tell you what to do. So he learned, receive from the Lord, and receive from the Lord through the church. Ananias was a priest. Receive from the Lord through the church also. That's what, that's the vessel of the church. That's what its purpose is. And the fathers of the church who are inspired. They are inspired and they preserve the faith for us. When I read their writings and I read the word of God and I speak to spiritual fathers or elders or mentors who have gone that way before, they'll help. You have to prepare. Get close guidance from your spiritual father. Next, we need to obey. It's a different way of living. Having radically different values. A revolutionary way of living in the world. And that's what we need today from the church. Do you think the world that we live in today, if the church was living the way the church should live, I'm not talking about like the church as an organization, I'm talking about me and you. If we live the way we live, the world would be like humbled by the presence of the church. But now, like I like to read like church leadership blogs and stuff, everybody's just making fun and criticizing the church. Saturday Night Live is making fun of the church. Like, everything is making fun of the church because it's a joke. When the church responds to its call to be the shining light of Jesus, to be the light of the world, the world will respond. But if you're going to be successful in following Christ, you've got to first understand that he doesn't care about where our lives are going, but also about how our lives are lived. We've got to obey His commandments. Some fathers of the church say that taking one commandment and obeying it to the fullest is enough to bring you salvation. The commands are real stuff. They're the real deal. Sometimes I ask myself, what commands am I like? In the book of in Proverbs chapter 7, it talks about take the commands, bind them to your fingers, and put them on the... Your, your foreheads. Keep the commandments right before you. Every day you ask yourself, what commandments am I following? Daddy, I'm not good and I'm going, like I'm not doing anything. No, no, what commandments are you obeying or in front of you? But every day, this command, I'm going to put it before me and I'm going to memorize it and I'm going to live it. I'm going to practice living. Live your commands. Not highlight them, put smiley faces in your Bible and 
Like, obey them. Actually obey them. Because God can't send us. He cannot send us if we're not going to obey. If, he know, if, if we don't have the intention to obey. You know, who knows what the word disciple is in Greek? Say it in the Vexologies. Coptic too. And ma -tis. The word ma -tis means a disciple is one who becomes like their teacher. Disciple is not just a student who takes notes and like I said, it's, it's the one that who wants to be like the teacher. One who is training to be like the master. And that's what the disciples are. And that's what we're called to do, to make disciples of all nations. To make people that are going to be like Christ. <coughs> There's no, I pray and I read my Bible, and that's it. No, I have to take and I have to obey. I have to obey and fulfill all that God has asked of me. James, Matthew 28 says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. Some of the translations say, teaching them to obey all things. Teach the nations to obey all things that I have commanded you. James 1, 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Before God will call you to something greater, He first wants to see what you have done in the small things. You have been faithful over what is little. You've been faithful over what is little. And now I'll give you more. I'm going to give you more. To experience God deeper. To expand His kingdom more. To, to widen the tents of the kingdom of God every day. The people that are faithful, they'll give them the tools to widen and expand those tents. And you, thought, you hear about that in Isaiah 54. This expanding of the borders of the tents of God. That God will give you the ability to do that. Isn't that amazing? And God says, now you are going to be able to expand like the tents and the dwellings of God. You gotta act. What does that mean? I want you to figure out like if you've committed to God's agenda and you've prayed and you've prepared and you've sought spiritual counsel and you're obeying, then you just take action. When God gives direction, take action in what? Like I said, what is God burdening, burdening your heart to do? The servants of God, they know when something's heavy. Like, I just have to do it. I have to go. What is God prompting you to do? What is He pushing you to do? What is He urging you to do? What are those things that you desire? What are those things that you want to do and you feel like you enjoy? What are those things that you're complimented at doing? What do people say you're really gifted at this? There's people, for example, singing. There's people with nice voices, and there's people with spiritual gifts of singing. Like when they sing, they bring people to repentance. They bring people to real worship. There's la'la, <laughs> deacons, we know what we're talking about. And then there's real worship, spiritual gift. Use it. Test it out. If you have a good voice, use it for the glory of His name. Sing, praise, worship, participate. If you're administratively sound, offer your talents. At our church, we hire a female that is the administrator of the church. She's a full-time administrator. She organizes and structures the church. We pay her a salary to organize and to administrate the church. She has the gift. She received like a master's degree at Harvard. She's a very bright girl. And she used her gift. Master's degree at Harvard. Working at St. Mark's Coptic Orthodox Church. God's gift. But she's shining. She's shining. She took that gift. That she's gifted it. And she's using it for the kingdom of God. Also look around you at what needs to be done. What needs to be done? 
do it. If there's something that your eyes have caught on that you see it needs to be done, act. Do it. Go do it. Put your hand to the plow and don't look back. Just go. Do the work of God. What if I'm doing something wrong? What if I'm not doing what's right? Like what Sadie was talking about yesterday, God will steer you once you put yourself in motion. <coughs> I'll read a passage from Acts chapter 16. Sorry, it's not in the PowerPoint. The text thing is just jumped up my mind. Acts 16, verse 6. It says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, it's talking about St. Paul, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mys Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. St. Paul was in motion. Holy Spirit said, no, don't go there. Stop right now. There's been so many times. So our church is nothing short of ginormous. Okay, like we have 50,000 people in our church. <laughs> and for three years, we've been trying to establish other churches so that to release a little pressure so that people can be served in a deeper way. Like, we just want people to have their own churches and to be served deeper so that nobody feels like they're not being served because there's too many people. For three years, I promise you, every time we meet as priests, we talk about, all right, like, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? People don't want to leave. People don't want to start. People want... We've been praying, praying, praying. In one month, three churches just opened up within, like, when it's God's time, it's going to work. But we were, like, fighting in our priests, like, and about, like it's, it's too much. People need, like, we have to figure out a solution that the church is going to blow up. <laughs> Three years fighting, arguing how, when, money, and this. Like, what are we going to do? Like, I literally happened. Three churches opened up in one month without us doing anything. God's timing. He's going to steer. He'll close doors. The right time is going to work. Everything's going to be coming to his plan. Last thing you've got to just trust. You've got to know your God. The question you ask yourself at all times, how can I serve the Lord today here in this place? You've got to trust that God has orchestrated the details of your life and He's been shaping you. The trials that you're going through, there's a reason. Abuna, it's been 10 years. There's a reason. I won't accept that. Do you know what I've been through? Do you know how late God is? Do you know how long I've been praying for this? And tell me to trust Abraham. 25 years. All right, Lord. Where's the kid? Circumcise yourself, yeah? Like, come on. 25 years ago I followed you. Now you're going to circumcise myself? You just got to trust that he wants the best in your life. Believe me. I always tell this, people when they come in and sit with me and they open up their hearts and, you know, problems and stress and whatever, I say at the end of every story, Jesus is the best. He's the best. Like now, you're frustrated and you don't get it and I don't have the answer now. But just wait. At the end of the story, you're going to be like, man, if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be where I am now. Joseph of the Old Testament, right? He was his father's favorite. Gets the cool coat, goes, sold into slavery by his brother, thrown into a pit. Sold into a slavery in another country. Lives in another country. What happens? I'm going to be faithful, God. I'm trusting in you. Potiphar's wife seduces him. And he says, what? Well, how can I do this great sin? This, this great wickedness and sin against God. What did that faithfulness get him? Jail. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> like imagine Joseph is away from his father's house in a different land, away from his father's altar, away from everything. Young boy, everything's messed up in his life. 
Oh, that's good. Like, live your life. Enjoy life. Never. The Lord is with me wherever I go. And the Lord honored his faithfulness by sending him to jail. <laughs> <laughs> he goes to jail, starts getting these dreams. People start dream he starts interpreting dreams and all this stuff. Alright, this is my ticket. He starts interpreting these guys' dreams. What happens? Alright, can you get out? Tell somebody, like, get me out of here. Two years. Nobody even remembers who he is. Two years in jail. At the end of the story, Joseph is king of the world. To save the whole world. Joseph, what part of the story would you change? Well, let's see, if I didn't go to jail, I wouldn't have been king. I wouldn't have been second in line. If I didn't get, say no to Potiphar's wife, I would have went to jail. If I didn't, you know, get sold to slavery, I wouldn't have been to Potiphar's house. If I didn't get, the whole path is God shaping for the time of when God is going to use him in a mighty way. Just trust that he knows what is best. There's a Catholic priest in the church some people say that he's converted over 10 million Muslims in the Middle East. 10 million. Do you know when he started his mission? Around late 60s. Not 1960s, I mean like 60s age. Like he was like around 68, 69. He's like public enemy number one of this religion in the Middle East, okay? They call him public enemy number one of, of Islam. 69, like you're waiting until I'm 69 years old. Sometimes old people say, eh, we're too old now. You're never too old. 10 million people. I don't know anybody that's converted 10 million of anything. <laughs> 10 million people. God was shaping over the years. Purifying, sanctifying, cleansing, uprooting things that are inside, making them better so that when it comes, that's it. Here comes the title. Here comes the title. I prayed that we would seek to discern his call, to know what he wants for my life, that I could be part of his great mission for the whole world. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Stand up and pray. We're going to sing a song. We're going to stand up. I want everyone to bow their heads. We're going to take quiet time right now, but we want to prepare our minds and our hearts.